Hello America and the world. Welcome to another show called Life After Lockup. This is a program that is designed for the community and for the public to, to see another side of the criminal justice system. Uh, before we get started with today's show, I want to always remind the, the, those that are watching about the activities of Life Community, what we're doing in the community of Paducah, Kentucky. Every first Monday, we have what we call the uh, Life, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Ex-Offender Support Group. I'm a little excited today, I guess you can tell that. The Ex-Offender <laughs> Support Group, uh, every first Monday of the month from 5.30 to 6.30. Every second and fourth Monday, we have what we call Teen Ease. This is a program designed for teenagers ages 13 to 17. Uh, we have food, fun, and fellowship, and we always have somebody there to help to navigate you uh, through your, your teenage years. This is every second and fourth Monday uh, at the, the Annex Building of Christ Temple Church. And every Tuesday at 11.30, we have what we call the <coughs> Life Saver Class. It's a class designed for anyone that have any life-controlling issues. If you have life-controlling issues, come out to the Lifesaver class every Tuesday at 11.30. We're sure that you can get some help from there. Every now and then on our program, we have uh, different kinds of, of shows that depict certain uh, aspects of the criminal justice system. Uh, I've uh, often talked about the fact that females sometimes get a harder time once they are released than sometimes males. And because of that, uh, they have to go through different things sometimes that uh, society might not understand. And I have such a case uh, like that today that um, I'm sure you're going to, to find fascinating. And I want to welcome to the uh, Life After Lockup program, I want to welcome uh, Melva Wright. Melva, how are you? All right, I'm fine. Good, are you nervous? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> but That's I'm okay. okay. <laughs> you're going to be okay. Um, I want um, to start basically from the first time that, that, that we met you, met you. I think you had just uh, did about six years. Yes, I did fed and time and then state time. Fed, fed time and state time. Okay, now I want to, uh, before we met you and, and before you went to prison, um, just can you kind of give us a little information about maybe how you felt like the life that you was living before might have been the, the reason why you went or maybe give some kind of indication as to why you might have ended up in prison? Well, I think now since I didn't got older and I'm really thinking about things, I think, well, I, first of all, I grew up in the foster care system. Mm -hmm. And then I had no structure, no one to care about what was really going on with me inside those homes, a lot of abuse, mm -hmm. a lot of sexual abuse. So I become, I become um, isolated, mm -hmm. quiet, um, timid, you know, around people and sometimes. So um, after that, going in and out of foster care and then going back and forth with my mother and my father, which my mother, she was uh, drug addicted. Mm -hmm. She was, um, she prostituted my mm -hmm. father, sold drugs. He was in and out of federal penitentiaries most of my life for selling drugs and pimping women. Mm -hmm. And so um, I grew up with that lifestyle. And then when I got older, um, I didn't know what to do because I didn't have no guidance. I had no guidance, but being in those institutions kind of made me just used to being institutionalized. institutionalized people having control over whatever I do or whatever I say. So, you know, um, but sometimes I think about if I just had one person that just took one, enough time to just to teach me a little bit, you know, and things might would have been things a bit things might would have been been a little bit different. May not been a lot different, but it been a little bit different. And, mm -hmm. and you had you had something that happened to you even before before then. Um, um, I think you had you had an incident where you had gotten attacked. Yes. Uh, can you kind of did you feel like talking about that a little bit? Um, sure. Um, uh, I was living in Indianapolis, and um, and this is like this is not my first rape. But this is the one, I don't know why, but this is the one that put me in a mental hospital. But I was walking down the street um, about two o'clock in the morning with my two kids, my five-year-old and my six-week-old boy. Um, me and my ex-husband had got into an argument, so instead of him being a man and giving me a ride to my auntie's, I was walking. And um, 
I got attacked by two men. And on St. Clair Street. And uh, after that, um, I just, I lost it. Um, when, I, you, when you say attack, it was, it was? It was a rape, right, okay. be, beaten. They was going to kill me. The police called them in the act, and I thank God for that. Um, that's the first experience. I'd have been through many experiences in my life where I didn't put myself in situations. Mm -hmm. That's the first time my life ever flashed before my eyes. Right, right. I've never been so scared in my life, you know. And so um, after that, um, I had to go to a mental institution, so I asked my cousin, would she take my kids so the system wouldn't take them, mm -hmm. so I can go in and get well. And I ended up staying uh, in La LaRue Carter, which is our state hospital. So do, do you feel like that that did something, made, made some changes in your life, almost like a non-caring kind of thing, or did it make you uh, feel basically numb to to some things. Do you think it had any effect on you as far as going into prison and things? Well, like that? I'm gonna tell you what had the effect on me when I got out, and uh, my cousin and the system wouldn't let me have my kids back. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I just felt like I have no. Um, sorry. That's okay. I just felt like I didn't have no reason to even try, so I just didn't care, <laughs> and I didn't even do drugs until up to this point. So. I started my drug addiction at a late age. I think I was about 23, 24. And um, I started doing drugs and I was just on a self-destruction path because I really wanted to kill myself, but I was too scared to. So I was putting myself in situations where I can die and it just wasn't meant to be, thank God for that. But So you feel like that, that whole thing basically started and then when you got out, and you, you couldn't get your kids and everything, so you just started doing things. And, and of course, doing drugs and doing stuff to get drugs ended you up, you know, um, uh, in prison and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I want to kind of fast forward a little bit mm -hmm. for, from, that, from that, that first six years or the six years that, that you did when you first came to, to Paducah. Um, that was the longest time because usually I was just in and out. But I, um, got mixed in with the wrong people and um, end up doing six years and I believe I got I believe I got played with because the only reason why they gave me all that time is because I wouldn't talk wouldn't say nothing but how can the feds also give me time and then turn around and give me state time for the same charges Wow you know wow. I you know because I, I really got sentenced to 23 years in this federal penitentiary. But God seemed fit. I knew he wasn't going to let me sit there all that time. I didn't deserve it. So some people had got together, and they got me a good, they got me a good appeal lawyer for the federal case. And I'm thinking I'm going to go home. They come get me out of the federal penitentiary and take me to Kentucky. Wow. <laughs> so you, so you, you, did, you did get released from the federal, but then the state picked you up. Mm -hmm. And you had to go, go there. Yeah. And by the time I got done with all of it, I was... I don't know, I was just done. I was just, you know, and when I got out, I came to Paducah, and that's when um, one of, I think one of the girls I met at the women's prison had connected me with you, told me about your church and stuff. And um, I came to Paducah, and I was staying at the uh, corporate ministry shelter. Right. But it got to a point where I was going, and I was signing up for housing, and I was signing up for, uh, for hood and everything, and I couldn't get no place to live, you know, so, and the shelter only let you stay there so long, wow. you know. So after, after the shelter, after your time at the shelter, they just basically put you out? Basically, and I ended up having to go stay with one of my friends, mm -hmm. you know, because it wasn't nowhere for me to go. Cause and, they, and was the reason because of your, of your charge? Was it was because of my charge. It was because of my charge. Um, um, they told me when I first signed up, they told me that I had to be out of jail, out of prison for three years before I can, you know, before I can go. Now, now, what, now what charge was it? Was it a, what, a, a dope charge? Uh, this, it was a drug charge, okay. yes. So, so the, because of the drug charge, you, um, you, you, you've done six years. Mm. And so now they're saying you have to be out for three years before they can let you in. Yes. Okay, so what are you supposed to do for three years? I don't know. <laughs> There's no, I mean, there, there was, I, I'm on a fixed income, so I, I couldn't find a proper place to live. So I ended up moving to Mayfield, 
where I found a little apartment that I can afford, halfway to afford. But when I got there, I couldn't sign up for food stamps because I had a drug charge. Wow. Now, now before you moved to Mayfield, now you, you tried to live, I think, with, with somebody here for yes. a while. Yes. And I think and this is one of the things that I, that I often bring up, too, when I deal with women that are coming out of prison. Sometimes if the, if the <coughs> shelters and stuff don't accept you and you can't find housing, uh, you have to stay with men. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, and whether it's uh, sexual, whatever, or is just a verbal abuse or whatever, did you have to experience something like that? Yes, I experienced both, and um, and I'm telling you, it's tough because you know if you leave that person's house and you on parole, and what can you do? You gonna go back to prison because you don't? They don't know where you're at. Right. You know, and the first thing that that man want to say to you when you don't want to do nothing, I'm gonna call your parole officer. Mm. So I told him one day, here go the phone, you pick it up, I'm tired, I'll go lay down, mm. you know? So, so this, now, because this is, this is something that, that I'm, I'm, I'm really, really concerned about, and I'm, and I'm hoping that this program will, will help, especially when it, come, when it comes to women, because you, 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 you did your time. You, yes. you, you did your time for the federal, you did your time for the, for the state, and now what you need is society to basically give you an opportunity to live. Yes. And uh, because of your, of your drug charges, almost like you're being punished all over again, even after you do your time. Yes. And, and, and now stop me if I'm, if, if I'm wrong. B because the shelter could not, um, would not allow you to stay there, you had to go stay with a, with a guy. Mm -hmm. And then when you got uh, enough of that, that's when you moved to Mayfield. Yes. Now, did Mayfield have better opportunities? They just had um, cheaper housing. Okay. But as okay. far as getting on food stamps and all that, I still couldn't get on food stamps. So I was, bar I was barely eating. I would go to, uh, and up there, you can only go to the food pantry once a month. Mm. So that's, that's what I was doing. And then in the process of doing that, I ended up getting a charge in Fulton, shoplifting. Mm. Wow. And I got four years for shoplifting. Four years for shoplifting. And how much of that did you have to do? Well, I think I did. I think I did most of it because I did six months on parole. So you did at least three and a half yes. years of shoplifting. Okay, and then when you got out from there, where where did you go from there? Well, I got out of. Um, they put me on parole the first time, and I didn't want parole anyway. I just wanted to do my time, so I wouldn't be on no paper. But they told me I couldn't, so I ended up leaving, being on parole, and they sent me up to Louisville to a halfway house, and. That didn't work out. That didn't work out because that halfway house wasn't about us. That was just about the people trying to make money. Okay. They they didn't care. They didn't care how we how how to make us stronger to be able to live back in society. You know, they said they wanted want us to be re rehabilitated and be successful in society when we get out, mm -hmm. but they're not giving us the proper tools. And women, we have the worst. We have the worst part of it. Mm -hmm. You what know. Do you, what do you mean by that? Because, okay, if they make you take parole, mm. they make you take parole, and now these days they're making you take it because, because it's, so, it's so overcrowded. Mm. So if you don't have a place to go, that you don't have a place to go, you're limited. So if they can't find a halfway house or somewhere for you, so you end up going to this man's house, mm. you know, and, and you, end up, you end up back in the, in the same old situation, you mm. know. That, that, and, and, and this is, this is the, uh, the, I guess, the problem that I'm having because um, once your time is done, once you, once you have completed what they have given you as far as the time that they give you for whatever crime you do, right. that should end your punishment. Right. But it doesn't. But it doesn't. It your doesn't. punishment goes um, even after you are out of prison even off parole, mm -hmm. because the charge is still there and you're still being held liable for the charge. And they have no, they have no statute of limitations on it. And I don't think that's right. So you're gonna tell me you can go back all the way to 94, 95 when I caught a charge and you're not gonna give me no assistance to help me live. So you, I mean, I'm just in a no-win situation because if I'm gonna survive out here and I have no family, nobody really helping me, 
So I'm going to have to rob Peter so I can pay Paul, and then I'm going to end up back all jumbled up again, and I'm going to end up back in jail again. Again. And, and now this last time that you were, that, that, that you were in, um, you got sick. Yes. Um, explain to me how they treated you, how, oh. how, how you had to survive being sick. Mm -mm -mm. Henderson County was the worst. I could barely walk. Them people wouldn't give me a wheelchair to go get my medication. The days that I couldn't walk in Henderson, they just wouldn't give me my medicine, you know. And then they finally, they finally broke down, took me to the hospital, found out that I had nodules all on my lungs and in my liver and stuff. Never told me, never took me back for biopsy. Didn't even let me know. Only way I knew is when I got out, I got real sick and ended up in the hospital. And, you know, thank God I went to Methodist there in Henderson and I had to, I had, they, the nodules was there then. Wow. And I mean, Henderson County, I mean, put you in a hole. And when I mean in a hole, I mean, you sleeping on the floor. They don't have no medical for women. Every jail I went to, there's no medical for women. So that when a woman gets sick, we go to the hole. So you treat it like you, you did, did something, something wrong. that wrong. So you don't get to order commissary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and commissary is basically the, the, what, the stuff that you need for your... For, for your, your hygiene and, and food, food and like you that. know, you don't hardly get to make phone calls. And, and, and Henderson, you can't even have your mail or write letters. When you're in the hole. When you're in the hole. And, 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 and you're in the hole not because you did something wrong, but because but you were for sick. medical. And then they got you on the floor. I can barely get up out of the chair, so I'm, they got me laying on the floor on the mat. They don't have no beds in the hole. They got... They got four and then come to find out in the back of the jail in the back of, they got medical they got medical rooms back there with hospital beds and they and they, they use that for storage oh <laughs> and they put the sick people on the floor yeah put me on the floor like i did something wrong so how sick were were you while you without them treating you uh, I was to the point where once I got out of prison, I was less than 90 pounds when I went into the hospital. Wow. And then um, the only reason why Henderson County even gave me two mats and uh, started giving me some uh, insurance because it is, um, sorry, right. it's because of the psychiatrist lady. Um, she she had she had to go to him and ask him. I've been asking forever, you know. And only reason why they sent me to the psychiatrist is because they found some hair weave under my bed. Hair <laughs> weave. They didn't know what it was on oh. the track, and um, they thought I was doing voodoo. All right. Yeah, I'm black. Okay, mm -hmm. and you got the hair weave, so you. Yeah. 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 And so they had a psychiatrist come in. Yeah. <laughs> and she's the one that was able to get them to get you some. I uh, had some to explain help. to her what it was. I said, "This is a track." I said, "I said even white people can wear it. We bonded in our hair." And I was like, "They even had a picture of it and everything." I said, "Is that why they took every took away everything from me and put me in a hole because of that picture? Because some hair weed they found." She said, well, they thought it looked suspicious. They thought you was doing voodoo. I said, what? They thought I was cutting people's hair off while they were asleep or something and sewing it. Oh, wow. But that, but that lady is the one that gave yes, you Yes, she's the one who helped me. Um, and then um, I got transferred to Davis County. They say a lot of things about that place, but I'm going to tell you, they took good care of me when I was sick. Wow. They made sure I had everything I needed. Mm -hmm. And they, they, didn't, they had a... a they had a medical, and they would put a guy out so I could have the medical room when I got sick. And they had a TV, and I got my commissary, and they treated me like, they didn't treat me like I was in trouble. Wow. You know. And so now when you got out this, this time, you, you got out sick. You pretty much was on, was on crutches. <laughs> I was on uh, a walker. On a walker. Yeah. Um, and because I remember going, uh, meeting you at the, the housing place to try to, to help you to get, to get housing. And e even though you were on a walker, you were sick, they still denied you getting housing. Over something in 95 that I didn't even remember. <laughs> yeah. Right, you didn't remember. <laughs> I remember they said this and you said, I didn't do that. And they had to tell you right. the record. So this was a, something in 1995 that, that they're using against you, the reason they won't let you 
have housing. So that means that you have to find a place like a regular person and pay the regular price. Like I'm doing now. Like you're doing now. And Greg, and Greg have to leave paying five fifty a month. Don't, I, don't need, I don't even get barely over $600 a month. So you do the math. So, I mean, I'm, this is the last place that I want to leave. I'm, I'm good. I'm, that's why I've been weaning myself from church. I'm just, I'm, I was comfortable there. You know, I was safe. I was, you know. And, and how dang, dangerous do you feel like it is for you to have to leave and go, and go somewhere? I'm be scared to go back home because that's where I call my federal charge at. No. And, and the only reason that you can't stay here, basically, is because you just cannot afford to I stay here. I can't here. afford it. I mean, I've even been looking for cheaper places to live, and I'm, there's no way I'm still going to be able to afford it. I mean, we, they, need to have, they need to have some type of statute of limitations on how long they're going to make us do this time. Okay, I got a charge for 95. You're not even talking about the charge I called before then. After that, you're talking about a charge for 95 that wasn't even a, it wasn't even a felony. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you're going to tell me that I can't get no assistance. I just want to know how many times do I have to keep doing this time over right. and over. And, I mean, you kind of lose hope because it's like you pushed in this corner and you darn if you do and you darn it if you don't. Right. You know, right. you know, I know if I don't go over here and steal me this piece of meat, I'm going to starve. Mm. You know, but if I do go over here and steal this piece of meat and I get caught, I'm going to go back to prison. Right. So, so now you're basically stuck in the, at the mercy of, of people who can help but won't help. Now, now let, me, let me ask you this. Now, where you're going, they're not going to hold your charge against you. No. And that don't make no sense to me. I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my thought around this. It's the same people. It's HUD. It's HUD. And it's the Housing Authority. It's all the government. Mm -hmm. It's all Section 8. That's all the government. Right. The government is a government. Right. So, but you're telling me I come home to Indianapolis, you're willing to help me. I can, I can get subsidized right up there. You know? Come on up, yeah. You just fill out an application, take you two or three months to get in. And I was like, well, what about my criminal history? And he was like, that was so many years ago. He said, there's nothing on your criminal history that's going to stop you. Wow, but here. But here, and then I told him what happened here. I was like, well, I'm in Paducah, and I didn't, I said, I didn't went head to head with all the, all the government places here trying to find a place to live. I said, even my pastor didn't went with me. And they won't give me a chance because of my criminal history. I said, so why is it I can get it up there and I can't get it here? He said, for one thing, for different states and different cities, there's different rules. He said, but mainly it's because Kentucky's a commonwealth, you know. So basically he's just saying they don't care about nothing. <laughs> is it either we just kind of do it the, the way that we want? Because they, I do believe that they, they <coughs> have the uh, authority to do as they, as they as please. As they please. And so it's basically they are not wanting to allow you to get in. No. And and when we went that day that you and I went, you were you were on the walker yes. then. Barely and moving. Barely moving. Mm -hmm. And you and God has blessed you. You're doing a whole lot better now, but still you you have done all this time. You within the last twelve uh, years, you've done almost twelve years. Twelve years. years. <laughs> yeah. You know, and some of the reasons why you've gone back is because you hadn't been able to get out and and uh, take care of yourself because right. you, you need help. People yes. people coming out of prison need help. They, they need society to step up. Not only just to put us in a, not only just to get a place and say, okay, this is a halfway house. You go to seven meetings a week. You go seven meetings a week, you pay your rent, you go to work, you follow our rules, and that's and you're good. Mm -hmm. We need more than that. It ain't more people got more problems than just drugs. They right. gotta understand it was a problem that led us to the drugs. Exactly. And and I, I always say to people in my lifesaver class that usually drugs is just um, the the numbing yes. factor for something bigger that has happened. Y drugs is, is is like the Band-Aid that a person yes. try to put on cancer and it's the cancer that needs to be dealt with yes and 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 I'm, I'm hoping that that this program will be will be seen by some people who 
who's in authority because it's, it's usually the people that are in authority that that uh, needs to make some rules yes. that are going that's going to help I think everybody needs to be judged by by their own particular situation exactly you know your situation even though yeah I, here's a, here's my paper here that's saying what kind of charge you have but if let me look at this person let me see that this person needs help and let me try to help this person. Each, each case ought to be taken separately, individually, and judged based on that individual situation. And what I just came to realize that there's more, they got more um, structure and stuff in groups and classes in prison than when we get out. You know, mm -hmm. you got parenting class, you, you have all the, you have, uh, you have community, you have uh, criminal thinking, you have all kind of classes that you got to take while you're in prison. But when you get out, that's when we need it. That's when we need somebody to help us live, you it, know? It, and I think you said the word earlier, transition, that there needs to be more uh, transition or classes that can help you to transition from doing six years, from doing almost 12 years, so that you can transition yourself back into society and, and, you, and you need help. Yeah. You need uh, physical help, mental help. You need uh, financial help <laughs> yes. in, or, in order to survive. And listen, I told you 30 minutes was going was gonna to go by fast, <laughs> and our time is, is about up. And I, I really appreciate your story. And, and I'm uh, praying for you, and I believe God's going to bless you. And I'm mm -hmm. hoping that the story gets out to people that can, that can help. Thank you so much for sharing it Thank with you us. Thank you so much. God bless you, and you have a marvelous day.